and uh, welcome to the lecture number three of our introduction to photonics video series. Uh, today in this lecture we are going to talk about the particle properties of light. Uh, if you remember in the first two lectures we talked about uh, the wave properties of light and also if you recall uh, we uh, talked about the nature of light. We define light as uh, both the wave and the particle. We also um, uh, elaborated on the fact that uh, certain phenomena that are related to the light can be explained only if the light is uh, considered a wave. And then also there are certain phenomena that can be explained only if uh, light is uh, uh, looked at as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a particle. So in this lecture we are going to look at that other aspect of the, of the nature of light, which is the properties, uh, which is the particle properties of light. So uh, in uh, this lecture, we are going to uh, uh, talk about photons. We are going to talk about the absorption. We are going to talk about, you know, other phenomena that are related to the light that can be explained only if you look at the light as a, as a particle. So we are going to be looking at the light as uh, particles uh, and uh, those particles that will be defining or determining the light are also known as photons. So a certain behavior of light, such as emission and absorption, uh, will be able to be explained if we are looking at this light as consisting of a, uh, of a chain of uh, particles or localized uh, wave packets. So we can uh, define a photon as the smallest division of light uh, that retains the properties of that light beam. In other words, um, uh, different colors of light will have a specific type of a, of a photon that uh, is going to be described by its frequency, its wavelength, and its energy. So we're looking at a photon as a particle that has a physical dimension and a, a location in space, uh, but more accurately, we're going to look at this photon as a wave packet uh, that carries a specific content of energy. On this slide, we are kind of uh, quantifi quantifying uh, the basic properties of a photon. So if we want to uh, calculate the energy of a photon, um, we are going to use the formula that is given on this slide uh, uh, that uh, basically uh, tells us that the energy of a photon is proportional to the frequency of, of, uh, of the photon. Uh, so energy shown here in the capital letter E is going to be equal to the product of uh, the constant H and the frequency uh, where uh, H uh, represents so-called Planck's constant that's, uh, whose value is given on the bottom of the slide is equal to 6.625 times 10 to the negative 34 of uh, joule seconds. So energy of photon in joules uh, can be uh, uh, given in terms of the product of the Planck's constant and the uh, frequency of that uh, photon given in Hertz. We can also use the formula for uh, that uh, to, uh, to uh, basically uh, uh, substitute frequency with the wavelength and the speed of light. So the frequency, we know that frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength, which would uh, transform the original formula into the formula uh, that's also given on this slide where the energy is a function of the speed of light and the wavelength of uh, light. Now let's try to put uh, some things into perspective. So we are going to be looking at a, a beam of light that is going to be uh, propagating through a specific uh, medium of a specific thickness. So what we see on this picture on the left hand side is a beam that's labeled here as incident beam and we see that this beam is going to be uh, propagating through a medium of a specific thickness that's characterized by the index of refraction N2. And finally, uh, the beam of light is going to be uh, leaving this medium and coming back into the uh, original medium characterized by the uh, index of refraction N1. What we can also see here, it's a little bit confusing, it's important to understand that the width of the beam, as shown here in the picture, does not represent the actual width of the beam, uh, but rather the width of the beam uh, represents the uh, energy that that beam is uh, uh, carrying. Uh, so if we have a wider beam, means that beam has uh, more, of, uh, more of energy. We see a few phenomena that are going to take place in this case. First of all, on the first boundary between the medium characterized by a uh, index of refraction N1 and an index of refraction N2. So on this first boundary, 
uh, a, a reflection is going to take place where a certain amount of light is going to get reflected and we see how the width of the beam uh, this uh, we can call it quasi width of the beam has been reduced meaning the energy of the beam has been uh, reduced uh, for the amount that has been reflected from the first boundary as the uh, uh, light propagates through the medium we see that its energy is going to uh, get reduced uh, and uh, the reason for that is because there is going to be uh, uh, two phenomena taking place in the in the medium, uh, one being uh, scattering and another one being absorption. In other words, uh, there's going to be an interaction between the light and uh, uh, the medium in the sense that a certain amount of power of this light beam is going to get absorbed by the material and also is going to get scattered to a certain extent. Uh, the whole uh, phenomenon of uh, absorption uh, or interaction of light with the matter, in this case medium uh, M2, uh, uh, can be uh, best understood if we are treating light as, uh, as a, a chain of uh, photons. So we can um, directly quantify the amount of photons to the, to the energy of, or power of light and then the absorption uh, for the, 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 the phenomenon of absorption is going to be uh, basically reducing the amount of photons or uh, reducing the power or energy of, uh, of the light beam. Here we are shifting the gears a little bit. So um, uh, in order to uh, properly understand uh, the, uh, the, the phenomenon of, of absorption as presented on the previous slide, uh, we have to move from a macroscopic model to a microscopic model. In other words, we would want to look at the atomic properties of, uh, of a medium. So if we go back to the previous slide, this medium here uh, is uh, going to consist of a whole bunch of uh, small particles, either molecules or atoms. So uh, now we are looking uh, uh, on a microscopic level what is going on in each of these different atoms uh, that, uh, are, uh, that uh, our original medium is made out of. So first of all, we have to understand that all matter is made uh, of uh, atoms, which uh, represents the smallest unit that retains the characteristic, characteristic of a chemical element that, that uh, medium is made out of. So atoms is the smallest unit that retains the characteristic of chemical element. And uh, we know that atom uh, consists of a positive nucleus that's surrounded by negative electrons that are uh, orbiting around the nucleus. So uh, what's important to understand again is that um, the basic constituents of, uh, of each uh, atom are electrons that are orbiting on a very specific uh, uh, orbits uh, that are shown here. There's a total of five of them in the case of uh, this specific chemical element. And each of these different orbits can carry a certain number of uh, electrons. For example, the first orbit that is the closest to the nucleus can carry a total of two electrons. And then the second orbit that's shown here as uh, orbit L can carry a total or a maximum of eight electrons. And then the third orbit is going to be able to carry 18 electrons, etc. So uh, each chemical element is... Um, uh, is uh, characterized by a certain number of electrons that is that are going to be distributed along uh, these orbits. Uh, electrons will be uh, filling the orbits that are orbits that are closest to the nucleus. So, for example, if we have five electrons uh, in an atom of a specific chemical element, two electrons will be sitting will be placed on a first orbit K, and then the remaining three electrons will be on the orbit L, etc. So that's, uh, uh, that's the first thing that has to be understood. The second thing that uh, also has to be understood that each of these orbits on which uh, electrons are, are orbiting a lot around uh, the nucleus, each of these orbits are characterized by a specific uh, level of energy. In other words, the electrons that are sitting on the first orbit would have a specific amount of energy that is going to be different than the, uh, the energy uh, on the second orbit or the third orbit, etc. It turns out that electrons that are closest to the nucleus uh, carry the smallest amount of energy. Uh, and as we are moving away towards the uh, outer orbits, the electrons that are being placed on those outer orbits will be characterized by, uh, by a higher and higher amount of energy. So there is a possibility for an electron to move from, a, from the uh, uh, orbit closest, closer to the nucleus to the orbit that's farther 
out uh, uh, and uh, the, the condition for that to uh, take place is that the electron has to uh, receive a certain amount of energy uh, uh, in other words, the electron would increase the amount of energy that it carries, and that increase in energy is going to result in an electron jumping from uh, from the from the orbit closer to the nucleus to the orbits that are farther away. So in this case, on the left hand side, uh, we see a whole bunch of different levels, energy levels that are characterizing uh, different orbits in a specific atomic model. So uh, once more, we model the energy of an atom. With the position of its, its electrons when the electrons are in an unexcited or ground state the atom is assumed to be at its lowest energy level in other words there is no electrons that uh, jumped up to our to a higher energy uh, orbits if a uh, atom absorbs energy in other words if uh, external energy is brought to the atom the electrons uh, that are uh, part of that atom are going to be or may be excited and can move into higher energy shells, higher energy orbits. Uh, as electrons are moving from one shell to another, uh, unique amounts or quanta of energy are absorbed or emitted, uh, where uh, that quantum of energy uh, comes in the form of a photon. In other words, if we go back to the previous uh, slide, if uh, we want to, uh, if if we want to move an electron from, let's say, the third orbit to the fourth orbit, there is going to be a difference in energy level uh, between these two orbits. So the fourth orbit is going to be carrying uh, uh, more energy. Electrons that are on the fourth orbit will be ca carrying uh, more energy than electrons that are on the third orbit. And that exactly that difference uh, between the energy on the third orbit and the energy on the fourth orbit, that difference in energy has to be uh, uh, equal to the energy of the photon that is going to be absorbed by this electron that is going to jump from the third to the fourth orbit. In other words, in, uh, the electron is going to move from a specific orbit uh, uh, of a lower energy level to a specific orb orbit on a higher energy level only if it received the exact amount of energy that's equal to the difference in the energy level between, between the two orbits. In other words, that, uh, that energy, that specific amount of energy that's equal to the delta or difference uh, of, uh, of energies of the two orbits has to come in the form of a photon. So that photon uh, that's coming from the outside through some sort of a, a, a external uh, excitation, uh, uh, those photons uh, would have to have exactly the amount of energy that's equal to the difference in energy between, between the two levels. So for example, if you're looking at the left-hand side, uh, if we would want to move uh, the electron for the fourth orbit that uh, is characterized by the energy level of negative 0.85 electron volts to, let's say, the uh, sixth orbit that's characterized by the energy level of negative 0.38 electron volts, uh, the electron in the fourth orbit has to receive the energy that is going to uh, change its energy level from negative 0.85 to negative 0.38. So what is that difference? We would take negative 0.38 uh, uh, and subtract negative 0.85, and we are going to get a delta in uh, energy that would uh, that a, a photon or, uh, would have to uh, carry. So the photon should be of a specific frequency that is going to result in a specific uh, amount of energy that is equal to this delta in uh, energy levels between the fourth and sixth, uh, uh, so fourth and sixth orbit. In such a case. That specific photon is going to be absorbed by the electron and the electron is going to jump from the fourth level uh, to the sixth level. Uh, that's also shown, another example is also shown here on, a, on this slide. So for example, if we want to move the electron from the first orbit, that's shown here as a, a having energy level of negative 13.6 to the third level that has an energy level of negative 1.5, that difference in energy is calculated here and it turns out to be equal to 12.9 electron volts. So that is going to be uh, uh, the energy that uh, a photon of a specific frequency should be carrying in order to be absorbed by an electron that is going to jump from the first energy level to the third energy level. This is extremely important because uh, as it turns out, uh, only uh, photons of specific uh, colors or specific frequencies or specific energy levels are going to be absorbed by, uh, by the material, 
while some other uh, 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 photons of uh, other energy levels are going to be passing through to that specific material. So only those photons that carry the energy that's equal to the uh, difference in uh, energy levels uh, of a specific atom are going to be photons that are going to be absorbed. So what we described on the previous slides on a microscopic level is a process of absorption. In other words, uh, the uh, photons that are propagating through a medium uh, will uh, be uh, absorbed by the medium and the uh, energy of the light beam uh, that uh, those photons are part of uh, will be uh, reduced. Uh, an inverse process to absorption is so-called emission. In other words, a material can also emit the light and in such a case we are talking about the light sources. So we want to kind of touch base here about uh, the light sources uh, just a quick introduction. So a light sources can be divided into two categories. They can be natural or man-made. Uh, natural would be the sun, observable stars, radio stars, lightning, uh, and uh, actually uh, any living body. It turns out that anything that's above the absolute zero temperature is actually radiating a certain uh, amount of uh, electromagnetic radiation that may not be visible to our eye, but if we push the temperature of, uh, of that specific object, uh, the, the frequency is going to of the radiation is going to uh, start shifting so we can uh, heat up a specific uh, medium to the level where the uh, frequency of the radiation uh, 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 enters the visible spectrum and in such a case we start uh, seeing that specific uh, material glowing in other words we are start seeing the emission uh, on the other side if you're looking at the man-made sources of radiation so we're talking about incandescent and fluorescent lights we are talking about heaters lasers masers radio and television antennas radars x-ray tubes a whole bunch of different uh, di different uh, devices that are able to uh, radiate uh, an electromagnetic radiation Let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, spectra of the light sources. So every light source is going to emit a certain radiation uh, uh, at uh, specific frequencies. So that range of frequencies that a light source is going to emit into, uh, emit into the uh, surrounding medium is so-called uh, spectrum. We, are, uh, we can define two different types of spectra uh, that are important in photonics. One is the emission spectrum and another one is absorption spectrum. An emission spectrum is formed by light that is emitting, uh, that's been being emitted by, uh, from a source, while while absorption spectrum is formed when the light uh, is uh, passing through a specific medium, and is being partially as absorbed. So uh, we are going to explain this uh, through an example, uh, and we are going to use the the, the the picture on the right hand side of this slide. So let's start from uh, from the from the uh, uh, case on a, on the top. So we can see here uh, a light bulb that uh, is emitting a white light. And if we are uh, moving that white light through a prism, uh, uh, through an effect of a, of a dispersion, we are going to have a white light being broken down into all uh, frequencies or all colors, which is going to result in a continuous spectrum that starts from the red color all the way on the left uh, to, the, to the violet on, uh, on the right. Now, if we take a hot gas, and that hot gas uh, turns out is uh, going to emit certain uh, certain uh, um, uh, electromagnetic wave uh, that's going to have a whole bunch of colors or frequencies. If we are pushing those colors and frequencies to a prism, uh, what we are going to see is a so-called emission spectrum. So this hot gas. Uh, has been excited and uh, by uh, the process of a heating. In other words, the, uh, the electrons are, are excited and they're sitting in higher energy levels. And uh, since those higher energy levels are not stable, most of these electrons that, are, that have been excited to the process of a heating, they'll start jumping uh, or uh, dropping down to uh, their uh, original uh, states. In other words, the, uh, they will be moving from higher energy levels to a lower energy levels in a, in a, in a corresponding atom. And every time uh, an electron moves from the higher energy level to a lower energy level, uh, its energy is going to get reduced. And uh, the, its energy is going to get reduced exactly by the amount 
of the energy that's equal to the difference between the two energy uh, states in a, in, a, in a corresponding atom. And that energy that's going to be uh, uh, emitted or uh, uh, released is going to be uh, at a specific frequency and that specific frequency is going to result in a specific color. So in the case of a hot gas that we are seeing uh, on this picture, uh, we have a specific discrete lines in, a, in, in emission spectrum. We see here the red line on the left hand side and then we have a yellow line and then uh, two shades of green and then light blue and finally all the way to the right we have a few uh, blue, uh, blue lines. So each of these different lines uh, represent uh, 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 photons of a specific color that have been emitted uh, out of this uh, hot gas after the electrons from high en higher energy levels have been dropped down to the lower energy levels. And finally, the third case is uh, so-called absorption spectrum. Why we are talking about the absorption spectrum? Here we have a light that's coming uh, from, a, from this light source on the left-hand side. Uh, uh, the assumption is that this light source, this light bulb is emitting white light, uh, meaning uh, light that consists of all the colors. Now, when all those colors are moving through a cold gas, here the process of absorption is going to take place. So in other words, the electrons in this case are going to be moving from a lower energy levels to a higher energy levels. So every time uh, an electron moves from the lower energy level to high energy level, it is going to receive a certain delta in energy uh, uh, through a form of a photon. So a photon uh, of a specific frequency or color is going to get absorbed, it's going to disappear, and its energy is going to be uh, transferred to an electron that's going to jump from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. It turns out that only a specific uh, colors or frequencies or energy levels are going to get absorbed by, by, by the material that corresponds to the energy levels, that, that's, that's a function of the energy levels uh, in a specific, uh, in, a, in a corresponding atom of, uh, of this uh, cold gas. That's why we see that in a, in a continuous spectrum, in a, in, a, in, a, in a spectrum that consists of all colors, there are certain colors that are missing. And those colors that are missing would be the colors or frequencies or energy levels that have been absorbed by the, by the cold gas. This cold gas is, uh, is a, uh, the same type of a gas as, that, as the hot gas, gas in the previous example. Uh, and we can see here that there are certain uh, 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 inversive property between emission spectrum and absorption spectrum of the same medium. Uh, in other words, we see that the, the lines in an emission spectrum, that uh, the lines in the emission spectrum, the colors of line in, in lines in the emission spectrum will be exactly uh, the, the, the shades of colors that are missing in an absorption spectrum because we are dealing with the same gas in uh, the only difference is that in one case we have an emission and in the other case we have an absorption. In other words, in the second example, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, electrons are moving from higher energy levels to lower energy levels, while in the case of absorption, uh, the electrons are moving from the lower energy levels to the higher energy levels. So to wrap up, uh, all materials with temperatures above absolute zero are going to emit an electromagnetic radiation an electromagnetic wave. Every atom and molecule has its own characteristic set of spectral lines that are uh, the property of energy levels that are characterized by the, the, that characterize that specific uh, type of uh, atom or molecule. The specific wavelengths and energies that produce a spectral fingerprint depend on the atomic and molecular structure of the material. In other words, the uh, lines that are going to be missing uh, from uh, if you remember previous slide, that, that the lines that will be missing from the absorption spectrum or the lines that are, are going to be appearing in emission spectrum of specific material uh, will depend on the type of a material. So in other words, we are talking about a spectral fingerprint of material or uh, we can also say uh, we are talking about a DNA of a material. So every material is going to have a specific set of uh, colors that are missing from the absorption spectrum or specific uh, uh, number of lines that are appearing in its emission spectrum. Uh, so uh, if you are analyzing the spectrum of a specific material, you can actually identify what type of material uh, we're talking about based on uh, the lines uh, uh, 
uh, or gaps in uh, their corresponding uh, emission and absorption spectrum. So the line spectra observed early in the scientific age led to a significant understanding of the structure of atoms and eventually to the development of modern quantum theory. So uh, this uh, uh, concept of uh, emission and, and absorption spectrum has, uh, uh, is uh, basically a foundation to many different fields, including the quantum theory and spectroscopy that uh, has found many, many different applications in, a, in a today, uh, uh, today a modern world. So it's very important to understand uh, the concept uh, as uh, there's a big chance that uh, as, a, as a photonic technician, you're gonna come across, across uh, this concept, in a, concept during, your, during your career. So if we are talking about monoatomic element, we are talking about a type of spectrum uh, that's uh, produced by an electric discharge passed through a gas sample contained at low pressure. So each of the lines that you're seeing on a, on a, in, a, in, a, in a spectrum, an emission spectrum, is produced by a single atomic transition from one energy level to the other, and the intensity of each line produced is dependent on the probability of atoms making that particular transition. Stronger lines are a result of more probable transitions from energy states having shorter atomic uh, lifetimes, while weaker lines are the result of less probable transitions from states that have longer atomic lifetimes. So we are talking about uh, significant transitions from, from um, uh, lower energy levels to higher energy levels. And uh, it turns out that uh, the whole uh, story is not uh, that simplistic as we described on a, on, a, on a previous few slides. We have to look at the probability. We have to look at uh, you know what transitions you know from what energy levels to uh, what energy levels are more probable. Uh, we also have to analyze a lifetime of a specific electrons uh, in an atom. Uh, so uh, the bottom line, uh, we have to understand that uh, there are certain nuances uh, in a, in every spectrum in terms of uh, how strong each of these different lines that are appearing in the emission spectrum are. And uh, as mentioned on this specific slide, uh, that's directly a function of uh, probability of a transition from one uh, energy level to another. And also it is a function of, uh, of the length of uh, or lifetime of a specific, of a specific uh, transition. So now we can uh, kind of establish the uh, transition from a, a microscopic uh, world into a macroscopic world, our example of, of a medium that's absorbing the light. So when we're talking about absorption, we're talking about the transfer of energy from the electromagnetic wave to the atoms or molecules in the material. That uh, transfer of energy uh, is uh, very specific for every type of a material. So the wavelength or intensity spectrum of light that passes to the material is uh, going to appear to have certain wavelengths removed. Uh, those will be the wavelengths that have been absorbed by the medium. And uh, for that reason, we are talking about so-called absorption spectrum. So the continuous spectrum of white light that has all the colors is going to be uh, turned into uh, an absorption spectrum where we see a certain gaps that correspond to those uh, colors or frequencies or energy levels that have been absorbed uh, by the medium. So we have an interaction between the light beam uh, and a medium, in this case a uh, gas, in the sense that, uh, as we already described, certain colors are going to be absorbed uh, by, by that medium. Another important concept that we are going to introduce in this lecture is a concept of so-called black body radiation. So we are talking about thermal radiation. Uh, we are talking about uh, the fact that any kind of object that, whose temperature is above absolute zero is going to emit a certain amount of electromagnetic radiation. So uh, we are talking about so-called thermal radiation, as I already mentioned, where the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation emitted by an object at some abs absolute uh, temperature T is going to uh, characterize that type of uh, thermal radiation. Uh, what you see on the right-hand side is so-called uh, black body radiation curve diagram. Uh, Let's explain uh, this diagram. Let's shed some light on this. Uh, what what this uh, what this uh, what these plots really mean? So, if you look at each of these different curves on a, on this diagram, these different curves on the diagram represent the radiation of uh, an object or a material at a specific temperature. 
So for example, if you're looking at the line that's all the way on the bottom, you can see that this line characterizes the body or object whose temperature is 3000 Kelvin. We can see that radiation is relatively weak because this line is very close to the, to the x-axis and is also relatively flat, meaning uh, um, object at this temperature is going to radiate at almost any kind of uh, wavelength in the spectrum. If you increase the temperature of, uh, of the object from 3000 Kelvin to 4000 Kelvin, you can see a certain difference in the shape uh, of, the, of the curve that uh, pre presents, uh, that describes the radiation uh, originating from that object. So we can see that radiation has been increased as a number one, as, and as a number two, we can see a kind of more pronounced peak in the radiation. In other words, there are certain wavelengths or certain colors that would uh, that would uh, radiate more uh, more from the, that specific object. If we continue increasing the temperature, we see that the peak starts uh, being kind of more pronounced. So, for example, for the for the uh, object of temperature five thousand Kelvin, we see that uh, most of its radiation is uh, in a already in a visible spectrum uh, uh, with a peak in an in a orange uh, range and we can see a lot of radiation in a, in a red range and in a yellow range and as we are moving far, farther from uh, orange uh, both uh, uh, towards ultraviolet or towards infrared we see that radiation kind of uh, is dropping down. If we increase the temperature all the way to 6000 Kelvin we see a very, very, very pronounced peak. We see a lot of radiation in the yellow range, and as we are moving away from the yellow range, the, the amount of radiation is dropping down. So there's a few conclusions that we can, uh, we can uh, derive from, uh, from this plot. The first conclusion is uh, as the temperature of the object goes up, uh, the peak of the radiation starts being more and more pronounced. In other words, the specific range of the colors that is going to be uh, uh, taking most of the, of the taking over most of the radiation. So that's the first conclusion. The second conclusion that we can also observe from this curve is that the peak of radiation is shifting towards the left as the temperature goes up. In other words, the, the peak of radiation is shifting towards a uh, ultraviolet range. So that's very important to understand because we can kind of correlate the temperature of, of the object uh, to uh, the peak, uh, or to the color of the radiation that's coming out of that object. So, for example, if we have a, some sort of a metal uh, that's at a very, very cold temperature, uh, that uh, metal is going to, uh, is going to uh, radiate uh, the wavelengths at almost any frequency and the radiation is going to be relatively weak. As we uh, keep uh, heating up that metal, the radiation is going to increase and then also the frequency of the radiation is going to start shifting towards the from the from the infrared range towards the visible range so ultimately when that metal if it survives if its melting point is relatively high to, uh, so that it, it is not going to melt uh, that metal is going to eventually uh, uh, that, that, uh, radiate uh, where the radiation is going to shift more into the visible spectrum so that uh, metal is going to start uh, glowing red and if we continue increasing the temperature the glow is going to turn into the orange and then yellow and it's going to move towards the ultraviolet range so in other words we can we can basically establish a correlation uh, between the color of radiation of a specific object and uh, and its temperature so this is a, a so-called black body radiation concept uh, and also black, uh, corresponding black body radiation uh, diagram that's being shown on, a, on the right hand side. This is a very important concept because uh, that's how we, for example, explain in astronomy uh, the difference between so-called blue stars and uh, red stars. So if you're looking at the star that, star that appears as a blue, it means that its temperature is much hotter than the temperature of the red star. Uh, in such a case, we are talking about a star that's relatively young, so it has a lot of energy, it's, it's very, very hot, and that's why it, it's, uh, it's emitting the uh, bluish color, that's why we call it the blue star. On the other side, uh, old stars that are you know, moving towards uh, their uh, ultimate death, uh, the temperature at the surface of those stars is uh, much lower, uh, and 
uh, the reason, uh, according to the black body radiation curves, uh, since the temperature is lower, the most of the radiation is going to be taking place in a, in a, uh, towards the red spectrum, and that's why those starts appearing as a red and they're called red stars. So that's just one example where uh, black body uh, radiation uh, concept has uh, found its application in astronomy. Okay, so we can uh, quantify the black body radiation through so-called uh, uh, wind displacement law. So we can see here a formula shown in a, in a box. On the left hand side we have uh, the product of the wavelength and the temperature. This wavelength represents the wavelength uh, of the peak of the radiation, where uh, temperature, capital T, is the temperature of the object. So if we have an object that uh, is uh, grow to the temperature of uh, capital T, then it is going to have, that object is going to have radiation with a peak at a specific wavelength or frequency, and that peak, uh, that that's, uh, wavelength, uh, lambda max, can be uh, calculated uh, from the formula shown here. What we have on the right hand side is a constant, so called Wien Boltzmann constant, equal to 2.898 times 10 to the negative 3 uh, meter kelvins. Uh, so that's the constant that's always going to be uh, there. And we can see if uh, capital T goes up, lambda has to go down. In other words, we have a specific shift of the, of the wavelength. Uh, towards uh, towards the ultraviolet range if the temperature of the object is being increased. Uh, here the uh, temperature capital T represents the absolute temperature that's given in the degrees Kelvin. So if the temperature is given in terms of uh, other units, uh, be it Fahrenheit or Celsius, you have to convert those units to Kelvin and then uh, use the formula, use the wind, wind displacement law that's been presented in a mathematical form uh, in the box shown in this slide. So to summarize, in this lecture, uh, we have addressed a few different phenomena that can only be explained if we are looking at the light as a, as a chain of particles. We talked about absorption, we talked about emission, uh, we looked at a, a microscopic uh, or atomic model of, uh, of uh, uh, a specific medium and we try to uh, to uh, characterize that medium by uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, its constitutive constitutive elements uh, atoms the position of electrons and we kind of correlated that to what is going on when a light is propagating to that uh, medium we've seen how the electrons are moving from a uh, lower energy levels to higher energy levels and uh, uh, the, uh, what enables that is the absorption, in other words, the uh, energy of the photons of the light are being absorbed, where the photons are uh, basically dying and uh, transferring their energy to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the medium. So everything boils down to the interaction of the light uh, and the medium, so phenomena such as absorption, such as uh, emission, can be directly related to that interaction of the light uh, and the medium. And finally, at the end of the lecture, we also talked about uh, so-called black body radiation. So we correlated electromagnetic radiation of a specific medium or object uh, to its temperature. We've seen that uh, the, the amount of radiation at, uh, at a specific frequency or wavelength is going to be a function of the uh, temperature of uh, that object according to so-called so wind displacement law. So all these phenomena that we talked about today uh, are described by, uh, by a, a particle nature of a light uh, and uh, we've seen that uh, some other phenomena such as reflection and refraction or bending of light are being explained as uh, looking at a light as a wave. So everything boils down to a dual nature of light, either a wave or, as a, par or a particle where one side, one aspect is being used for certain phenomena and then the other aspect uh, uh, of light to another uh, uh, set of, uh, to the other set of phenomena that uh, are uh, characterizing the light. So that's uh, what we had for the today's lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, lecture. Uh, there's these uh, phenomena that we talked about is uh, extremely important in many, many uh, fields of science. So it's very important to understand them. And I hope that you understood them uh, and we'll see each other next time.